Hello everyone and welcome to the introductory lecture of the Architectural Theory Val Seminar, which this semester is entitled Of Clouds, Rainbows and Storms, Thinking Meteorologically in the Information Age. So the first lecture is entitled Staring at the Sky, Smelling the Air, and it really aims at introducing the semester topic and the manners in which such topic will be approached. Um, so the seminar will be exploring the antique tradition of the Meteora, which I will define in just a couple of minutes, but which would today be uh, called the weather. And it will do so in a contemporary key. Um, so we will be exploring um, how we can think of and about the Meteora, but more importantly so, how we can think in and with the Meteora in our contemporary condition, in our information age. We will seek to understand what it entails to uh, embrace the Meteora rationally, uh, in rationality or for rationality, and what it entails to invite events, to invite chance, to invite accidents in the physical and intellectual domains, uh, not against but alongside order, stability and exactitude. So we will question not only uh, how it is that architecture can uh, resist, can oppose resistance and provide shelter from the Meteora, but most importantly so, how it is that architecture can operate and can um, produce um, stabilities in the weather and in the information age. Uh, we will follow uh, the tradition of looking at the sky, of looking at the Meteora through its antique uh, religious manifestations, and dimension, but also, and most importantly, through philosophy, and more specifically, in the accounts of the physical nature that it has, uh, of, the, of the universe that it has produced, both in a materialist and in an informational uh, perspective. We will also be uh, chasing the Meteora through poetics and literature, and through arts and architecture. Another question that will be at the heart of our um, uh, exploration is, who are we when we engage with the Meteora? And that is through erudition, through poetics, as I said, but also through techniques and technology. So to start uh, exploring this topic, uh, I would like to uh, maybe state the obvious, make a very obvious remark, which is that the Meteora, the weather, are a subject of daily preoccupations and a topic of daily discussions, daily conversations. Um, it is something we even discuss with strangers, or rather it is something that we specifically discuss with strangers, possibly because, as everyone experiences it, as everyone lives in the weather, it establishes a common ground. Uh, it therefore seems that we are all somehow interested and caring about the weather, and that we all certainly talk about it, and that the meteora are therefore a locus commune, a common place, not in the sense that they are banal, but rather in the rhetorical perspective, in the sense that they are common, a theme that is common to all orators. The meteora inhabit our everyday talks uh, in casual, prosaic terms, uh, and, and also in the metaphorical dimension, for we are well used to talk about the menace of history on the man's life in terms of storms and clouds, or to evoke mist or lightning to carry the idea of entangled situations or abrupt strokes of fortune. But in the tradition of the Meteora, there seems to be one constant, which is, as we see in Michel Serre's quote from the birth of physics in Lucretius' text here, which is namely that the weather is primarily of interest to some only and not to all. Um, as Michel Serre writes here, the meteora, that is the clouds, rain and water spouts, hail storms or showers, the direction and force of the wind here and now, are of interest, and I quote, to those in whom the learned have no interest, peasants and sailors. And this is a recurrent trait of the ancient treatises devoted to the study of the Meteora, namely that they are addressed to practical men, to those who appear to be more immediately and more directly concerned by the atmospheric changes. This is the case, for example, of the treatise on the signs of weather written by Theophratus of the Rhesus, 
which is uh, specifically addressed to farmers and sailors. And as Siders and Brunschen note, uh, most of the ancient treatises uh, are devoted to such practical men, um, including millers and herdsmen, sailors, military planners and fishermen. And this remains true throughout the centuries, as we see from the incipit of the uh, meteorological yearbook written by um, Jean-Baptiste Lamarck. Uh, this is, was a, a recurrent um, uh, endeavor, and this, uh, which you see, uh, was written in the 10th year of the New Republic, uh, that is 1801-1802. Um, interestingly, in, an time, in a time that was marked by the attempt to reinvent the counting of time through a new calendar, uh, and here, as you see, the, um, this uh, yearbook, which aimed was uh, to assemble and order the different sources of observations of atmospheric variations in order to uh, generalize, uh, um, in order not so, so much to generalize, but to identify orders and to uh, identify climatic generalities. Well, this yearbook is specifically um, uh, addressed to, uh, to peasants, to doctors, and to sailors. Yet today, with the increase in extreme weather events um, that tend to inscribe meteorological manifestations into the global concern for climate change, uh, it seems that the meteora are not anymore uh, the interest of practical men, but really everyone's concern. Temperature variations, precipitations, and air pressure seem to open up a tight articulation between our local realities and our general systemic condition. So, to start addressing the topic of this course, to understand what it is that we look at when we stare at the sky and what it is that we feel when we smell the air and what it is that we talk about when we talk about the weather, we need to draw a series of distinctions. The first one of these distinctions between being between the climate and the weather. The climate what is an average uh, weather. It is an average weather for a given geographical space. It is um, the meteorological conditions that prevail in a specific region, uh, including temperature and precipitations and wind. So the climate operates conceptually. It operates in the long term. It implies an abstract relation to the weather, to this uh, reality of the day-to-day -day and hours by hours transformations that we feel on our skin. The science to which we relate to these permanent changes today is meteorology, whose roots plunge into the antique tradition of the meteora. Meteorology prolongs, so to say, the um, antique tradition of the meteora it prolongs the ambitions of the first thinkers who contemplated the sky, aiming at explaining the um, phenomena by observing them, as well as forecasting and predicting weather variations. So etymology, as I was saying, plunges its roots into the Greek tradition of the meteora, referring to the original notion, the original concept, da meteora, etymologically the celestial phenomena, things that are in heaven above, things that are high up, that are raised from the ground, that are lifted, that are hanging. Uh, the term meteora being itself composed of the prefix meta, by means of, and aor, the suffix aoros, lifted, lifted up, suspended, hovering in the air. Therefore giving us today meteorology, the science that deals with the phenomena of the atmosphere, with those raised, those hanging uh, phenomena, especially, therefore, with weather and weather conditions. So, today, metrology is considered to be a sub-discipline of the atmospheric sciences, and it is concerned with um, a smaller number of phenomena than uh, those that the early thinkers of the meteora were interested in. So today meteorology is still concerned with aerial meteors such as wind or aqueous ones such as rain and snow and hail. It is still concerned with certain luminous meteors or igneous ones like lightning, but it has uh, now abandoned other manifestations such as comets and shooting stars. Um, as the development of the scientific method and the invention of measuring instruments 
has made the study of the meteora enter a quantitative dimension. In its early occurrence, in uh, the very first treaty that was specifically dedicated to the matter, which is the, 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 the Meteorological Treaty of Aristotle, written in 340 before Christ, and which will be the first text that we will encounter during the seminar, um, Aristotle uh, was considering the Meteora in a wider scope than we do today. Yet, the originality of his gesture was precisely to establish the study of the atmosphere by restraining it to a specific autonomous domain and providing unifying principles for said domain. He writes, We already discussed the first causes of nature and all natural motion, also the stars ordered in the motion of the heavens, and the physical elements, enumerating and specifying them and showing how they change into one another and becoming and perishing in general. There remains for consideration of part of this inquiry which all predecessors have called meteorology. It is concerned with events that are natural, though their order is less perfect than that of the first of the elements of bodies. They take place in the region nearest to the motion of the stars. Aristotle here therefore defines a specific domain, the sub-learner world, within which the attention can be focused on a number of phenomena. Said domain unfolds from the earth crust, which for Aristotle was uh, um, encapsulated, it was concerned, it was um, uh, taken into the sub world, to the region nearest to the stars, therefore including a wider spectrum of phenomena than what is considered meteorology today. Aristotle goes on enumerating those. He is, will be treating of, about the Milky Way and the comets and the movement of the metals. He will also study all the affections which may, come with, which may call common to air and water and the kinds and parts of the Earth and the affection of its parts. Uh, he will also be concerned with the causes of the winds and earthquakes. And finally, with thunderbolts and whirlwinds and firewinds, but also with the rainbow, etc. So what I would like to suggest here is that to think of the meteora implies a change in the locus of our attention. It is uh, to consider a space in between, to consider specifically a milieu, a milieu that is not only our surroundings and our environment, but more precisely, following the French etymology, to consider a middle place coming from me, the middle, the medius, and the lieu, the locus, the place. So this intermediary domain uh, is to be concerned not only as being delineated spatially, that is uh, between the heavens and the earth, but also being temporarily bound, temporarily, rarely bound between the oikumene, the inhabited earth, which in today's condition encompasses the whole world, and the cosmos, the starry sky, the heavens whose motions were believed at the time to be the efficient cause of all terrestrial life. For ancient meteorology, the meteora therefore unfolded between two stabilities, between two durable orders, that of the sky, characterized by the eternal durable order of the stars, and that of the earth, itself qualified by a durable order, one that we would today describe as a geological duration, which far exceeds that of our human existences. The meteora were therefore precisely localized in this milieu, in this intermediary region, lim delimited on both sides by stable domains, in a zone at once of instability and of permanent change, of continuous transformation. Sky and Earth, the heavens and the oikumene, were understood as domains of order, domains in which phenomena were characterized by stability, their order being qualified by periodicity in time and space, that is, that is by regularity and predictability. The milieu of the meteora therefore appeared ex negativo, as that which evaded, as that which evades, as that which escapes this account of order, founded upon periodicity and stability. What the seminar proposes to do is to shift our focus to this intermediary domain, 
to smell the air and stare at the sky in order to think and feel those changes and to do so not as one would contemplate and rationalize an external reality from which they remain profoundly alienated, but rather to do so by acknowledging that we are entirely immersed in such reality, that we inhabit the weather and possibly, if we perform a topological inversion, that the weather inhabits us. The invitation to think meteorologically is therefore an invitation to question the idea that there would be a, a precise, a strict border or strict limits between us and the meteora, between the subject and the milieu. And it is also an invitation to address this general organization as something in which we are, we have a part in which we are fully embedded, to which we contribute rationally. We will come back to this um, idea throughout the semester and we will address these correspondences between the human and the meteora, how they have been uh, accounted for, uh, these relationships between the sky and us, between the sky and the city, the, be it through analogy, through uh, homomorphism, through um, indeterminacy, through resonances, through continuum, etc. So to do so, the seminar will be exploring different accounts that have been given of the meteora, the manners in which man has historically talked, pictured, expressed and rationalized these phenomena. And um, we will attempt to rationalize them while nevertheless holding on to the admiration that such phenomena provoke in us. Um, even Descartes in his own treaty on the meteor, written in 1637, where he proposes to uh, study the nature of the meteora in order to desacralize them, in order to explain their extreme complexity so that they cease to be puzzling, um, aiming in doing so to consecutively allow grasping um, what is admirable on Earth and what is complex on Earth. Well, even Descartes starts his treaty by pointing to the natural admiration that these phenomena provoke in us. And I quote, we naturally have more admiration for the things that are above us than for those that are at an equal height or below. The meteora have indeed and remain a privileged support of imagination, a realm to which imagination races whenever it is set free, and as such, the meteora have inspired numerous literary, symbolic and poetic projections. The sky appears to, to us as a domain where ideas, fantasies and words interweave outside of any predetermined disciplinary language. As a cloud permanently transforms as it advances under the variations of pressure, so can our rationality evade the positivism of earthly knowledge funded upon experiential facts and their logical relations. That is what the French philosopher Gaston Bachelard seems to suggest when he writes, and I quote, for a moment we are in the clouds and we come back to earth, gently teased by positive men. No dreamer attributes to the clouds the serious signification of other signs of the sky. In short, the reverie of the clouds receives a particular psychological dimension, it is a reverie with no responsibility. However, this last statement feels out of order today, or at least goes counter to what we would like to propose in the seminar. Not only because in our time the clouds they are, that are as much physical as they are informational are not without consequences and less serious than other manifestations, they rather appear simultaneously as treasures and menaces on the one hand being devastating and overwhelming, while on the other being nurturing and fertile. This is also because to escape from positivism need not to be a synonym to reveries with no responsibility, as Bachelard suggests. With the seminar, we want to take the meteora seriously in our rational and irrational accounts of the world to pay attention to it. The history of meteorology illustrates how the interest in the weather has always been minor, how the meteora have always been, in a way, overlooked, 
with regard to other questions and topics. Although since Aristotle, the models or explanations that were developed to account for them have been fully dependent on and actively interwoven, involved in the development of sciences, there indeed appears to be a constant throughout history, which is that this branch of sciences has been overlooked, that it has been less developed or less quickly than other Centuries after the initiation of the Aristotelian physics and uh, centuries also after the investigation of um, the investigation sorry, of natural philosophies uh, of the Renaissance, uh, metrology embraced the evolutions of modern sciences to, and I quote Luke Howards here, to be more successful than the observations of the philosopher and learn from the experience of those who depend on metrological phenomena. And again, Howard cites the mariner and the practical man. The regularization of observations through the development of quantified methods of data collection and statistical analysis of said data at the turn of the 19th century, as uh, Jean-Baptiste Lamarck's study epitomizes, um, and the transfer of data rendered possible by the invention of rapid communicational techniques and specific uh, new um, uh, observational methods and experiential methods, as much as the attempts to produce classifications, again, as in uh, Howard Luke's uh, nomenclatures in his studies on the modifications of cloud, and the attempts to introduce methodological nomenclatures in order to, as Howard would write, allow the metrologist to apply the key of analysis to the experience of order. And finally, all the way to the import of advanced mathematical and computational techniques in the wake of the two world wars, such as uh, with uh, the use of the uh, ENIAC co-developed by John and Clara von Neumann, uh, which opened up uh, to observations and predictions on a massive scale. Well, throughout that history, all the way to modern, the modern science of meteorology, uh, it has, in a way, pushed the ancient desire to find the signs and the causes of variations, that is, to physics, chemistry, mathematics, and to study transformation and movement, etc. It has pushed it to extremes. It has given, uh, given rise to the dream, the fantasy, the desire, to maybe ultimately control the weather. Hence, today's consideration uh, of ancient qualitative metrology as being negligible because it is scientifically outdated. Hence also Bachelard's remark on the daydreaming, on the being in the clouds as synonym to reverie with no responsibility. If we want to consider ancient metro meteorology in this seminar, it is not to claim its scientific um, veracity or validity. It, if we propose to smell the air and stare at the sky, which might seem an activity without any sort of seriousness, or even worse, as an activity which is absolutely out of place given the criticality of our contemporary situation and condition, it is because I want to understand how the escape from positivism need not be a synonym to reveries without responsibility. The seminar will take the, the Meteora seriously, therefore, in uh, rational and irrational accounts of the world, and not in its contemporary, disciplinarily determined form of the meteorology, but rather as a manner to think of a being in the world that accounts for weather not as simply a natural fact, and to matter, substance, time and space and information not simply in natural terms, in other words, this seminar is an attempt to repatriate the weather into human sciences and, most importantly, into architecture. To do so, we will move across philosophy and mathematics, sciences and literature, arts and architecture, and um, in order to contemplate what we can hope to learn by looking at and thinking of and with the Meteora. And to do so, I would like to tell a short story, that of Chaos, the history of Chaos, which is not what you see in the, in the picture here, but nevertheless a personification of um, the Meteora, 
the story of cows is a Greek myth that allows understanding how in antiquity man has accounted for the changes, the accidents and chance um, that determine and forge the atmosphere in which we inhabit through metaphysical and physical models in intertwined manners with cosmologies, the study of all that is, and cosmogonies, the study of the origins of the universe. Chaos was the first of primordial gods of the Protogenoi. She was the first to emerge at the dawn of creation. She was followed in quick succession by her um, siblings, that is Gaia, the Earth, Tartarus, the pit below, and Eros, procreation. Chaos was the lower atmosphere which surrounds the Earth. She was both the invisible air and the gloom of fog and mist. The word chaos means gasp or chasm, an abyss, being the space between heaven and earth, precisely. As mentioned in the Theogony by Ezion, written in the 8th and 7th century before Christ, Chaos was the mother and grandmother of other misty essences, including Erebos, the mist of the neverworld darkness, including Nyx, the day, and uh, sorry, the night, and Himera, the day, including also Aether, the ethereal mist of heavens. And that she was also the mother and grandmother of the numerous emotion-driving daimones, which haunted it and influenced fate, of which Chaos was also the goddess. As the goddess of the air, Chaos was also the mother of all birds, just as Gaia, the earth, was the mother of land animals, and um, Thalassa, the sea, was the mother of fish. Late classical authors would then refer and redefine Chaos as the chaotic mix of elements, a sort of primordial mud out of which the universe would emerge. Um, and this is where the um, English term chaos uh, stems from. So to think meteorologically, uh, I would suggest uh, after this short story is to explore, um, it's to, sorry, to, what we will explore in this seminar is to think this uh, shift uh, from thinking through limits and borders that has characterized modernity in order to think in a manner that does not claim or establish an exteriority of humans to nature, that does not imply a break between the subject and the world. Therefore, thinking meteorologically implies to um, be sensible to the mobile, to the blur, to the diffuse, to welcome chance in our rational, technical and poetical accounts of the world. To embrace the meteora thereof engages us to think of being in a world as fully immersed into this domain of permanent and constant change in space and in time. To be fully immersed into a domain of mixtures, really, and as a consequence to elaborate an understanding of inhabitation neither as a static condition nor as a rooted one but as a fluctuant condition, rather, one that is open to fluxes and that transforms alongside the atmospheric variations. In this perspective, architecture will be considered as a vessel which navigates between the two poles of mélange, mixture and purification, between porosity and enclosure between the pole of fluidity on the one hand, as epitomized by the figure or the archetype of the observatory in its historical relation to the Orologion, and on the other hand, the pole of reification, as epitomized by the laboratory, the perfectly controlled environment, the closed space that allowed for the enunciation of modern science, protected from uh, any turbulence. We will therefore always maintain as a backdrop the image of the Aerides, which you see here, the Tower of the Winds, the very first meteorological station known, a civic building that arises at the feet of the Acropolis and was meant to be seen by all citizens. This observatory, which is also known as the Orologion of Kyristos or Cyrus, rendered visible and thinkable the meteora by means of the articulation of a series of allegorical figures with a series of mechanisms, a weather vane, sundials and a hydraulic clock or clepsydra driven by water coming down from the Acropolis. So, to conserve this image as a guide allows establishing 
a different relation, not only to the meteora, but more largely to timekeeping, to duration, to durations, to an unrolling that is less strict than the periodical and long-term one of the astronomical phenomena, or of the stratified one of the geological time. It allows to um, uh, establish a different uh, relation to a temporal unrolling that gives freedom to our lives, but in intervals that are even lesser than the periodical returning of the seasons, which, uh, as Homer wrote, uh, allows to know that, and I quote, the year has gone full circle and come back with the seasons returning. So the meteora have short existences, they have furtive existences, they are constantly done and undoing, and appearing, disappearing and re-emerging, embedding us into a heterochrony, into states determined by the simultaneous unfolding of different chronologies, of different speeds and durations. The thickness of the meteora milieu is indeed plastically transformed by the resonance of different cycles, by the synchronization and asynchronization of continuous changes and perpetual calendars. To account for such cycles, lofty and earthy ones together, may allow therefore envisioning architecture as a practice of locally producing stabilities in a universe at large, rather than, as William Morris wrote in the 19th century, molding and altering to human needs of the very face of Earth itself. To think of such movements of transformations and of chance does not amount to abandoning any capacity to rationalize uh, and order the world, our existences and our thoughts, but rather it engages us to think about the unpredictability of weather as that which resonates locally with the globally predictability of the climate. It is this resonance or correspondence that Michel Serre encapsulates when he writes about the climate's chaotic turbulence, that is, globally predictable and locally unpredictable, its tremendous variations in space and in short time, seasons, years, centuries, or long duration, thousands of years or millions of years, fluctuate on the basis of simple and universal laws of mechanics, physics and thermodynamics. To think of these chaotic turbulences does not imply to ontologically or categorically oppose them to equilibrium, but to approach them as highly singularized local variants within one universal model. And Michel Serre continues. Nowhere on earth today does the weather repeat itself, everywhere different in space and always various across time. These local differences, without any uniformity, are produced by the global climate system. So, there exists at least one universal model with highly singularized local variants. Better still, a kind of global equilibrium across variations that are peaceful or catastrophic, cyclones and hurricanes. So embracing this polar setup, the seminar will therefore suggest that uh, we can evade the idea of a unique overarching measuring system and of the, the dialectical accounts of the world it has produced in the wake of globalization. As much as we can evade the fascination of a fractal order of things that implies a self-similarity throughout scale domains. We will instead contemplate different orders of magnitudes and the intricacy and resonances of different scales, of different scale domains, in a manner that also accounts for rifts, for broken symmetries and for catastrophes, as René Tom formulated in mathematical terms. To conclude, this seminar will propose that the flickering figures that populate our skies and the unstable, wavering, humid, dry, cold and hot conditions we inhabit 
with their silent transformations, to quote François Julien, and with their phase transitions, with their permanent inversions between regularities and change, should invite to a form of ontological letting go. Differently from what's stated by Wittgenstein, we will contemplate if and how we can build clouds in different combinations of matter and forces as different mixtures into our informational condition in a manner that conjugates history with physics and information with form and substance. To conclude, we will follow Emanuele Gotcha's invitation to think of a meteorology of thought in the Aristotelian sense of the word. We will explore, to analogy, to metaphor, to architecture, poetics and mathematics, how the transformations in the layout of natural elements can change the face of a place and determine its temporary inhabitability, as Gotcha writes. And we will try to think if, in such a manner, we can also address the radical transformations of knowledge and know-how as perman the permanent activity of modification of existing elements. Thank you very much. <laughs>